Hey, how you doing, Justin here. Welcome to lesson two of Rhythm Maestro, in which we're going to be looking at how to tie notes together. But before we get into the nitty gritty, it's really important that you're feeling super confident with the stuff in lesson one. Okay, you really want to be hip with the count one, two, three, and four, the ands in between, one and two and three and four and, and you should be able to work out a rhythm that is using all of the downs and a few ups with it by ear. Okay, I'm just going to play one for you now. I want you to see if you can work it out after four bars. So here's the pattern. Two, three, four. How'd you go? Easy? Or like, oh, not sure about this? Maybe skip the video back again if you need a second listen. But you should have figured out that that was a quarter note pair of eighth notes, pair of eighth notes, and another quarter note again. Okay, one, two, and three, and four. Assuming you were cool with that, now we'll get stuck into what ties are. So musical ties, as opposed to neck ties, tie notes together. So if you have two notes that are tied together with this little curved line between the note heads, the first note is held for the duration of itself and the note that it's tied to. Now, if we have a look up there, you're going to see two bars of notation, and they actually sound exactly the same. Sounds like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. But obviously, now, if you're looking at here, you're going to be looking at the tie bar going, that looks a lot more complicated than the first bar does. And usually we use ties to make things clearer and easier to see. In this particular example, I'm just using it so you can very clearly see the effect of the tie. Now, if you look in the first bar, you'll see that it has a half note. If you remember, a half note is worth two beats. And in the second bar, the start of the second bar, we've got two quarter notes that are tied together. So those two quarter notes, the first one and the second one are tied together. It would be one note held for the duration of that time. So it sounds exactly the same as the half note. So after that, I've got one quarter note and then I've put two eighth notes tied together. Now the two eighth notes and the quarter note, this is in the second bar, sound exactly the same. So if you've got a quarter note or two eighth notes tied together, they would sound the same. There'd be absolutely no different. There wouldn't be a reason to write two eighth notes tied together as in that way instead of just a regular quarter note. But just so you can clearly get the idea that by tying two notes together, there might be another way of writing it. Which leads us to our next and probably the biggest question about ties that I get when writing them down is just kind of why would we need to do it, particularly when there are other ways of doing it. So let's have a look at this next example. The first two beats, you can see I've written an eighth note, a quarter note, and an eighth note. So that rhythm would be one and two and, and then the, I've just kept three, four on the end. So one and two and three, four. One and two and three, four, because we've got half a beat followed by a whole beat by a half a beat, okay? One and, and three, four would be that bar. And that's actually, it's not too bad to read it that way. But instead of putting the quarter note in the middle there, if we write it as two pairs of eighth notes and then join the middle two up, it makes it super clear that we've kind of held between those two beats. And then we have one and two and three, four. One and two and three, four. The tie just very clearly shows that it's tying over. Now, personally, if I was reading either of those, I'd be kind of cool with that because I can still see where beat one is clearly. I can still see where beat three is. But there are times, and particularly one very common strumming pattern, where that's not really the case, and that is this one. Now, what's happening here, we've got beat one as a down strum, then we've got beat two, then we've got the and after two, we're missing beat three, we've got the and after three, and then beat four. Now, this strumming pattern is one of the most common strumming patterns of all time. I call it Old Faithful. It's this, one, two, and three, and four, one, two, and three we're not playing on beat three. Now, what happens when we're reading music is we like to see the beat. Now, this is still relatively simple as far as rhythmic notation goes, right? We're saying pretty simple. But as soon as we remove beat three, like in the first bar there, 
it kind of throws off our eyes a little bit because we can't really see where the, the beat is. We're used to seeing particularly quarter notes. We're used to seeing them on the beat. So when they're not on the beat, it's a bit like, oh, what's, what's happened there? Whereas if you write it as the eighth notes and then tie the middle two together over beat three, it's very, very obvious to the eye that you're going one, two, and and four and that you've got that little tie there over beat three it's visually easy to see especially when you get more complicated rhythms it becomes more important but it's worth learning at this early stage all about ties i'm going to give you one more example now where we've got an eighth note quarter note quarter note quarter note eighth note so it's still four beats in the bar but now the quarter notes are all on the off beats because we've started with a half a beat. So we'd end up, this pattern would be one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Now, that is a really badly written piece of music. If somebody, if I was teaching at a school and somebody handed in some music that was written like that, I'd be like, nah, man, that's, that's not how you do it. Seeing all of that line of quarter notes there, you just assume that they're on the beat, especially if you're reading things very quickly, like in a chart reading situation. That would just be really, really bad writing. So what I would recommend that you do is get used to this idea of always trying to write so you can see the beat, particularly beats one and three, but preferably all of the beats. So you should have a note on beat one, two, three, and four. If, it, if it's not being played, then you want to use a tie to get rid of it. Okay, now this, like I said, we're still staying in pretty simple territory for this lesson. But the sooner you get to grips with this, the sooner we can start working out real world patterns and writing them down. And this will become more and more important the more complicated we get. So let's now have a look at some really common one bar strumming patterns that use ties. Now, particularly this first one, I call it Old Faithful. It is the most common strumming pattern that there is. And if you only knew one strumming pattern, it should be this. It's definitely one that you want to learn how to hear and you want to learn to write down. Comes in lots of minor variations, but in its basic forms, just one, two, and three, and four. Down, down, up, up, down. One, two, and three, and four. One, two, and you can see there we've got the tie going over from the and after two on to beat three. So beat three is not played. Okay. Now this one works like nice and slow. But it also works. You're going to hear it all the time. So it's definitely one that you want to learn to keep your ear out for. I'm going to give you some examples to go and listen to for this one and many of the other patterns in a little bit as well. So that's the first one. The second one that I think is really, really common is where we miss beat two. I call it the drop two pattern. So it's more or less the same thing, but we move that little uh, rhythmic grouping that was in the middle to the front. So we end up having one and two and three, four, one and two and three, up, down, 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 up, up, down, 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 up, up, down, 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 up, down, down, Okay, really, really common. I call it drop two. It's, these are names that just I give them for myself to reference stuff so I can write it down, but you might like to use the same terminology. It's completely up to you. But that's drop two, one and, and three, four. One and, and three, four. The third pattern I want to share with you, I call the long one. Now, up to this point, we've only tied together eighth notes, but you can also tie together quarter notes like this one. So this time we've got beat one tied onto an eighth note starting on beat two. So that first strum is held for one and a half beats. We have one, two, and three, and four. One, two, and three, and four. One. Again, really, really common pattern, that one. The last one I got for you, I call it Proud Coffee because it's the one from Proud Mary and also Coffee and TV by Blur. Very, very kind of similar pattern. Uh, it's this. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. 
Now, on, that means that we're not playing on beats two and four. So we have one and miss, up, down, up, miss, up, down, up, miss, up, down, up, miss. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and... Now, this again, this is a very, very common strumming pattern. Definitely one that you want to get hip with, okay? So you're literally just writing all eighth notes for the whole bar and then you're going to join the and after one onto beat two and the and after three onto beat four. So we're not playing on beat two and four. One and two and three and four and one and three and four and when you were a beginner guitar player you probably found this idea of missing the down strums quite difficult hopefully you're at this kind of intermediate stage you're like yeah man i can be handling that no problem now one of the things that can be really cool is that you can actually play a hit on beats two and four or a pause so you can either have You can either do a proper hit or just a mute. All that. Now, the idea when you're hitting it down on that, I tend to call that then playing eighth notes with a back beat. Okay, because actually you're playing all eighth notes except for two and four and you're putting that hit on. The back beat is what you call the snare drum when a drummer plays like a... This... Excuse my horrible beatboxing, but this... That sound is always happens on beat two and four. That doesn't always happen. Very commonly happens on beats two and four. When it does, it's called the back beat. So that would be playing eighth notes with a back beat. So I've got these different names for it. Like I said, I'm going to share with them, share them with you as we go along. But you don't have to use them. Just what I want you to do is be able to write them down. So make sure you check out what it looks like and you understand the count and you understand what's going on. So now we're going to check out a little twist in the tail here for ties, which is that they can go over bar lines. Right? So a tie can go from one bar into the next bar. In fact, it's a very common way of using a tie. Uh, if you had a big chord that you wanted to ring out for two whole bars, you would write a whole note in one bar, a whole note in the next bar, and tie them together. And that chord would ring out for the duration of both bars. So you'd have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So that's how you get a chord to ring out over a bar line, right? They're also used for a thing called a push, which is where a chord changes just one eighth note before the bar. Okay, I've, I've got whole lessons on this. I kind of feel like it pushes me in the back when we get a push. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But before we do, I want to take you through two of the really, really common strumming patterns that use this idea of the bar line going over. They're both two bars long. Now, we can have, I should mention, uh, strumming patterns that are two bars long that don't use a tie that goes over the bar. In fact, that's a very, very common thing to have a two bar strumming pattern without a tie. Okay, that's perfectly legit but the two that i'm going to show you right now are both ones that use a tie that goes over the bar line the first one i just call it the common push because it is the strumming pattern that seems to get used most commonly when you're pushing chords one two three four <laughs> important you get those three upstrokes in the row one two three and four and one and two three and four one two three and four and one and two three and four like i said very often you'll put a chord change on the and after four seems to be the most common way it works so you might go uh one two three and four and one and two three and four one two very very common little technique this idea of the push 
when you're transcribing rhythms, so you don't want to be thinking so much about the chords. You want to start with the rhythms first of all, and you've got to try and exclude that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second as well. So the second really common two-bar example I want to give you, I call it the slow bow. Uh, it's a little bit like the bow diddly rhythm, which is this famous like... <laughs> We're going to be looking at that in this course, but in the next grade, because it's 16th notes, a little bit trickier. But what's going on there is these kind of, we call it a, a groups of three against four. So what I mean by that is each note would be held by three eighth notes. Okay, so we'd end up, say, having the, this pattern that I'd recommend that you check out is this. One and two and three and four and one and two, three, four. Those first ones are all held for three eighth notes each. So you could think of it as like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. That I wouldn't recommend that you count that. I just want to demonstrate that it's these groups of three. Be one, two, and three, four, one, and two, three, four, one, two, and So that's another really, really common pattern. And again, by studying the basic patterns, learning how to write them down, if you're listening to a tune, you go like, oh, that sounds pretty much like that pattern. You've got a really solid starting point. And then you might be tweaking it a little bit and adding a bit or adding a note or taking a note or whatever. But at least then you've got like a really solid starting point. Time to test you out now a little bit. So we're going to start off with hit points. So I'm going to be doing muted strums. I want you to try and write down the rhythm, remembering to use your ties where appropriate. I'm going to play each pattern for four bars each. Just a little mention as well. A few people said, oh, it's a bit easier because I can see your hand moving as you're playing. I mean, to be honest, if you're listening to a track, you should imagine that the person's hand is moving consistently over it anyway. So I don't think that's probably going to help. If, it, if you find it is helping you and make and easier for you to be able to do that then look away or close your eyes while I'm doing the thing. Another thing that's going to be a little different to try out today is that I'm not going to be giving you the tests with the metronome. So often when you listen to acoustic music there's no metronome there to help you so you have to keep feeling where the beat is. I'm going to give you a count in so try and count in. I'll do my best to keep myself in time as well. So let's see if we can work it out. Here's the very first one. So one, two, three, four. How'd you get on? I used to write it down. Don't be afraid to pause it now, have a little think, maybe rewind it, have another listen. Okay, I'm going to show it to you in just a sec. So you finished, pause it if you're not ready, then come back. Okay, there it is. That's what it should look like. One, two, three, and, and. Nothing on beat four. Okay, let's move on to question two. One, two, three, four. Okay, again, have a little pause, write it down, think about it. Can you imagine it? Dun, da, dun, 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 da, dun, dun. One, two, and three, four. One, two, and three, four. One, two, and three, four. So time right over on the three like that. Okay, let's check out the next one. It's question three. One, two, three, four. How'd you go? That's one that you want to learn to write down real quick to go, oh, it's just that. You done it? You know what it is? All faithful. Got to learn to recognize that one right away. Last question, number four. Here we go. One, two, three, four. How was that one? Recognize it? Sound familiar? Not really? 
There we go. That's the first set. So that was just hit points. And remember, what you're trying to train yourself to do is when you're listening to an actual recording, you're trying to remove all of the harmonic information, just listen to the rhythm, rhythmic information, and end up what you're trying to write down is the hit points. That can be a real helpful thing. So real world styly stuff now. I'm going to be changing chords as well. So I'll give you the count in, then I'm going to play the same strumming pattern for eight bars. Here we go. One, two, three, four. How'd you do? As usual, answers for these ones are over on the website. You're going to have to go and get yourself the worksheet if you want to know the answer for that one. Let's check out question two. One, two, three, four. It's a fun one, eh? Okay, question three, here we go. A one, two, a one, two, three, four. How was that one? A bit faster, wasn't it? Probably not gonna be able to slow it down if it's on a video as well, but really, really good practice. Hopefully you're kind of recognizing that one because it might be something you heard before. Okay, let me just check what is number four. Okay, here we go, the last one for this. One, two, three, four. <laughs> you get on with that one hopefully you've done all right with that one as well answers over on the worksheet on the website in the last lesson i explained why it's really important to practice clapping out rhythms as well so not just playing them on the guitar and reading them but actually tapping them out clapping them tapping your pick or whatever it is that you want to do now it does raise the question at this point like if in a tie when a note is held longer obviously the clap doesn't last longer if i go this or this or this you can't tell whether it was a whole note, a half note, a quarter note, or an eighth note. You can't tell, right, until where the next one falls. So the reason that it's good to practice it, well, there's a few different reasons. One, if you're going to learn to read rhythms, if you're reading them and clapping along and you understand where the ties are and you can find the hit point, like where the, where the actual notes are going to start, it means that you understand it properly, that you're going to be confident with it, your comprehension of reading rhythm is solid. Okay, and it will get better and better the more you read rhythms, the more tapping out you do. Especially, we haven't talked about it much yet, but the idea of speeding those things up, so learning to play it nice and confidently and then gradually speeding the, the rate that you can read it at. Again, it's just making your rhythmic mental calculations faster. That sounds all kind of, lots of kinds of horrible, but anyway. Just one thing to note about the clapping as well. Using the guitar profile is a really effective tool because you can play the guitar profile and clap along with it, and that way you'll always know if you're getting it right. So as well as just being able to read it and tap it playing along the guitar profile thing something i wish i'd have when i was learning this stuff because you can literally just it'll, it's got a sound already you can adjust the tempo so slow it right down or speed it right up and then just sit and clap along and you'll hear pretty quickly if you're playing with it or not the other part that becomes really important with this is this recognizing the hit points which i talked about it already when you're listening to a rhythm when you're trying to transcribe a rhythm off a record, you want to try to forget the chords. You want to try and lose all of the other information and just focus on the rhythm of the strumming. Because what you're going to find when you start trying to do it in the real world is there's lots of other stuff to distract you. There's uh, vocals are the biggest distractor. Because when we listen to a song, our ears are naturally drawn to hearing the singer. So we have to be able to like ignore that and just focus in on the guitar. But often you'll have more than one guitar part. So you might have like one guitar playing arpeggios and another one doing the strumming. If you're trying to work out the strumming part, the arpeggio one can get a little bit confusing because you hear those notes. So you're really starting to train your ears to dig in and focus on a particular bit. And the bit that you need to focus on for strumming is the hit points. So even if you're hearing this, it 
I just want you to hear that. I'll be straight with you now, it does take a lot of practice to learn how to do that. To sharpen your attention in, to be able to ignore all of the stuff around and just focus in on that rhythm stuff takes practice. But the sure thing is you're never going to get there if you don't practice it. And it's not as hard as you might think it is when you first start. Like, I still remember trying to listen to rhythm patterns and being like, I just can't hear it, there's too many things going on. And there are songs where it's really complicated. If you listen to uh, Cocaine by Eric Clapton, where there's like a hundred guitar parts all swirling around at the same time, it can be really hard to focus in on an individual part. But again, it just takes practice. I'm going to give you some real world examples to work on this week. And some of those have got specific things that I'm going to mention that you want to try and weed out and, you know, yeah, learn to focus your ears on a very specific part. So I mentioned the push earlier and I said I'd circle back around to it. So let's just have a little chat on it. Now I have got a full lesson just on the strumming patterns that use the pushes and all of that sort of stuff, the practicalities. What I want to talk a little bit more about is the hearing of it and the writing down of it. Now, if you were writing down a two bar strumming pattern and the chord changed on the push on the and after four before the new bar, you would simply just write the strumming pattern out, but write the chord above the and after four, not at the beginning of the new line. Okay, so that's first thing. You would normally just write the strumming pattern out as normal and move where you put the chord. So you wouldn't put it at the beginning of the second bar. You'd move it above the note, which was shown the and after four. But you don't always want to have to do that. And I'm thinking there's quite a few times where you've got like a, a very similar strumming pattern, like even eighth notes or something like that. And you don't want to have to write the rhythm every time. And when you do that, there's a real nice shorthand way of writing a push, which is just to write an eighth note with the tail. So just the eighth note, and you would know that it was the end after four, with a line, a tie going over the bar line, not even tying onto anything. That is the way that we write a push. So in that particular instance, I might write just, if it was a four chord sequence, I might just write those four chords at the start of every bar. And if one of them was a push, I'd do that little eighth note with the tail and the line going over the bar. And that would remind me, that would say, hey, there's a push there. Now, this is really useful for you, any of you guys playing in bands and stuff and writing out rhythm patterns. Okay, super helpful. If you're playing in a band, you get, you know, you've got band rehearsal and you've learned the songs, just to write yourself out a very, very basic chart and just making a note of where the pushes are so that the rest of the band and you don't forget. Okay, because they are the kind of thing where you do all want to be doing them. The, the rest of the band will probably appreciate it. If you go, hey man, I think there's a push there on that fourth bar, assuming you're right, that is. Um, and then you can discuss whether you're going to do it or not. So writing the push down, that's the little shortcut, the shorthand way of writing a push. I see it all of the time on a session if there's some sort of chart around. So I definitely uh, get familiar with that too. So up to this point, all the rhythms that we've been looking at have been comfortably paced, shall we say. Nothing too scary fast. But when you first encounter one that's going like a million miles an hour, a really helpful tool to use is like slow down software. Now, the one I personally use is called Transcribe, but there are many available. There's a, a free multi-platform multi one called Audacity, which I hear is very good. It's not like I said, it's not the one I use, but it's going to be great and it's free. So the idea, if you've got a really fast strumming pattern, just use that to slow it down to say 75% or something like that. If you go really slow, it can tend to sound a little bit murky and harder to hear the rhythm patterns actually. But just often slowing it down that little bit for a few listens, I think can really, really help. So don't be afraid of using a tool like that. And while we're on the, the tool approach, one thing that you'll find definitely helpful is repeating one section over and over. Rather than trying to listen to a song like a whole section of a song, it can be really helpful to just, most of these kind of tools like Transcribe have a selector, so you can just select one or two bars. Okay, obviously you need to find where beat one is, but you can do that when you count along. Just count two, three, four while you're listening and then click and then drag your cursor over until you get to the end of beat four. Make sure that it's looping up nicely. Then just listen to it over and over again. There's something about the repetition that will help with this uh, the sharpening of the ear, shall we say. When you're listening to it over and over again, you can kind of start to peel back the layers and get really focused on the one part that you're supposed to be paying attention to. Now, one last thing before we get into the real world examples, and that is variations, because you are going to hear variations of strumming patterns as you listen to the same song. Very, very rare is that one strumming pattern used exactly the same all of the way through the whole song. It's just, that is really unusual, which is one of those things where I've kind of worries me when people say, hey man, what's the strumming pattern for that song? Because it's very rarely the case that there is a strumming pattern for a particular song all of the way through. 
What you might find is there's a strumming pattern base for the verses and the choruses. Usually they'll be different. Not all the time. There are going to be examples where it's the same most of the way through. But, uh, you know, often you'll have one strumming pattern for a verse and one strumming pattern for a chorus and maybe a different one for the bridge. Or maybe it'll be the same as the chorus. But there'll be usually at least two. You'll also often get what I call fill patterns, which is every 4, 8, 12 or 16 bars, usually every uh, groups of 4, drummers will usually put in a little fill. And it can be just a very small one, a, sm a small change in the strumming pattern. But it just kind of signifies these sections. For some reason, we feel groups of 4 bars very strongly. So if at the end of 4 bars you just put an extra strum or miss one out, it's kind of like acknowledging the fact that there was this 4 bar sequence there. You will hear that all the time. It's very, very common. So it'll be like all the same time. Let's say it's that. And then coming up on the fourth bar, you'll hear something like... Just that one extra one. Or it might go something like... Okay, there's just going to be these, you know, same strumming pattern all the time and then there'll be a variation. That's another benefit for looping one section is that you're not going to get put off by the fact that there might be a variation there. There's one other very common way that strumming patterns change and that's when the amount of chords in the bar changes. Now particularly if you're doing something like that had an old faithful pattern. So if you're going one, two and three and four, one, two and three and four. Now if you had suddenly something going one, two, three, four, one, so you had to play on beat three, you're obviously not going to be able to keep that pattern going because you're not playing on beat three. So you had this. Three, four, one, two, 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 three, four. Then you might be back to the original pattern. So there are lots of reasons strumming patterns might change. What I try to do when I'm teaching and what I'd suggest you do when you're learning a song is to try and find a kind of a general strumming pattern that is used most of the time, but not all the time. And then you just have to feel your way through your own variations. There are, of course, going to be times as well where you can't hear exactly what the right strumming pattern is. So you're just trying to go for a feel. You're trying to find the pattern that feels like it's probably the closest to what's going on, but you may never know. And that's totally fine too. Let's get into some real world examples. So I'm going to give you some set songs. Some or all of these might be your taste or they might not be, but they're all really good examples. And each one's got something that you'll learn by trying to transcribe the rhythm of. If you want to try and transcribe the chords, that would be great as well. But primarily what I want you to try and listen out for is the strumming patterns for each of these. And the first one, Man on the Moon by R.E.M. Okay, so just go and check out the song, listen to it over and over, particularly the first part of the song, see if you can pick up what that strumming pattern is. It's definitely stuff that we've covered today already, might be a slight variation of one that we've looked at already, but you should be able to do it. So have a go, because that's a really, really great one. Second one, Half the World Away by Oasis. Again, the pattern is one that you should be familiar with already by listening to this lesson. It's one that you've definitely heard. But there are little variations in the chords. As I mentioned there, sometimes where the chords change, some of the patterns change. So it's about learning one pattern, but then also keeping an ear out for the variation of that to fit the chords as you're going to play along. Next song is What's Up by Four Non Blondes. This one is a two-bar strumming pattern played on electric guitar. Not that that makes any difference. You can do all of these strumming patterns on both acoustic and electric guitar. It's a fairly straight strumming pattern. I'm not anticipating many of you having problems with that. I think there's only one tie in it as well, and it doesn't go over the bar line. I'll give you a little tip on that one as well to start off with, but that's a really, really great song to check out. Next one, A Girl Like You by Edwin Collins. Now, we're starting to get a little bit sticky here in that there is quite a distinct strumming pattern, but it's also got pushes, so some of the chords are pushed, and it's also buried a bit. There's a lot of other things going on, so that's a good one for trying to teach yourself to get focused on a particular part rather than trying to have an obvious strumming pattern that you're learning. There's a whole lot going on. There's drums, there's rhythm guitar, there's other leady kind of licks going on, and you've got to try and focus just on the strumming part there of the, the you know, the chordy part. You'll probably find it difficult. It's one that I'd be surprised if many of you went, yeah, oh yeah, that's just that and you were able to play it. it. You'll probably come away from practicing that feeling like, yeah, I'm not really sure about that. And the reason I know that is because I feel like that when I learn it. I'm listening to it, it's like, well, because there's changes and, you know. But it's a really good one for, again, focusing your ears. 
While we're on that, another great one in a similar kind of vein is Brown Eyed Girl, the Van Morrison version. There's a great strumming pattern in that, but it's buried underneath an arpeggiated guitar. So there's a guitar playing all of these arpeggio parts over the top. Now, again, you can train your ear to hear underneath it, to, to be able to hear what the strumming part is doing and not let yourself get distracted by the arpeggio guitar part, but it isn't easy. So again, when you listen to it the first few times, you'll be struggling to hear it as a separate thing. But it's one of those, it's like the more you do it, the better you get at it. Wow, that's such an uncommon thing. The more you do something, the better you get at it. Now, your ears are not a muscle, but they do get stronger every time you give them a workout. So even if at first some of this stuff feels like you're never going to be able to do it, you need to persevere. You need to keep on strengthening your listening ability and you will get there. You, you'll be amazed at these kind of exercises, how much it improves your the ability to focus your hearing's attention. Uh, that sounds a bit of a mouthful, but it really... It changes how you hear music, I think, in a beautiful way. You understand the big picture of it. You can see the detail. It's, it becomes, for me, I think listening has become more beautiful the, the more I've learned to focus my ears on individual elements within the music. So two more songs for you here, but I am going to add a whole load more over on the website. So if you happen to be over on YouTube, click the link in the description. Maybe you'll find some songs more to your taste. But the two ones, Mr. Jones, Counting Crows. Now... That's got a very obvious and clear strumming pattern, but it's also a little complicated because it's got lots of pushes. So when you're starting to write that one down again, the, the thing to learn from that is to ignore the chords and just focus on the rhythm part. If you can really get yourself totally focused in on the rhythm by itself, without the chords, it'll be relatively easy. Then you can go and add the chords afterwards and you'll have the whole song. Okay, really, really good one for that. Great, great one for practicing writing out rhythms for that. And the last one, Little Talks. Um, just a killer tune. Really good, obvious guitar parts, but some good variations in there as well. So it'll be a good one for you to learn to hear the main kind of bass strumming pattern and then have a listen for the way the variations of the strumming pattern occur and how that works. So I think it's a really good idea to do some real world stuff. Like doing the exercises with me is definitely, hopefully helpful. Hopefully it'll help you develop that sort of skill set. But doing it on your own and with an original recording, I think can be so, so helpful because it is actually the point of the whole thing. And as we get more and more complicated and learn more and more things, it become more and more useful. So look, I really hope you enjoyed this. Don't forget, of course, that there's a worksheet over on the website that you can go and pick up. Probably going to be helpful. There'll be some extra sheets as well for the tapping along. The guitar profiles, again, super helpful because you can actually play them and play along and make sure that you're tapping right because the Guitar Pro software will be clapping along with you to make sure that you're getting it right. So loads of good things there waiting for you over on the website. So go and check that out. If you are over on YouTube, always appreciate you hitting the subscribe button, slapping me a like, and let me know in the comments how you're getting on or if there are any songs that have got really good solid rhythms that you'd like me to recommend or maybe help me and put it over on the website. Really appreciate your help and support, of course. I'll see you for plenty more lessons very soon. You'll take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.